Well, it's good to see you. Uh, it's been a few weeks, and uh, actually, when I don't have to go speak publicly for a period of time, I just don't shave. It took me 20 minutes to shave this morning because it, it was that big, you see, it grows fast. And so I had to go three passes before I got it. I'm surprised my face isn't all cut up and bloody and all that, but uh, I'm back into that. Also, I noticed that I had some, before I begin here, some extra cards of Paul's four life-changing prayers. I just found them in my uh, bag here and I'm gonna make them available. Anyone wants them, so most of you probably have them, but it's, if you aren't you using these things, if you take this card, you know where I want you to put it. Where am I going to tell you to put it? I've told you this before. By your mirror in your bathroom, because that's where dead time takes place. And if you just had that in front of you while you're doing your, as I call them, your morning ablutions, uh, washing up and all, this is going to be just, just reading. Every day, and after a while, it'll begin to sink in, and that's what I'm wanting for you. So they're free. I have extra copies of these, so I thought I should well, go ahead and put them there. So that's the, the next thing. And the next thing is today is a different kind of a day because we're in between topics. As you can, you can see where we've been, where we've done all these topics, and we're all the way down to almost to the bottom margin in life, you see? So we started with relationships, that's a long time ago. And as perhaps some of you know, most of you probably do, that on the uh, reflections.org website, because that's what the name is gonna be, it's, uh, it's uh, really kenboa.org now, but we're gonna be uh, releasing a new version of the website and then calling it reflections.org, which is important because I'm in a juncture in my life where I want to pass it on. You see, I want to actually give it to other people rather than just try to make a legacy for myself. You see what I'm saying? So taking my name off is a, is a good move because it's symbolic of the idea of it being a team of us, you see, and building into the next generation. So that's uh, what we're supposed to do when we reach a certain point in life. But having done so on the, on the reflections.org or kenboa.org website, um, all of these talks are there. If you just go to the homepage and look at uh, weekly studies, go to Friday morning, they're all there, all the way back from the very beginning. So I'm pleased that we've got that, that record of all these things we've done, but we've covered a lot of bases today in our time together, haven't we? Those of you who've been with us for a while, uh, relationships, focus zoomed in on marriage, parenting, and friendship, and again, a kind of a 30,000 uh, foot view, but enough to give you a feel for the biblical uh, emphases in these. And then work was an important topic because why do you go to work? And so you don't, as I said, go to work to earn a living. You go to work for an, it's an arena of influence, a place where you mix it up in the marketplace and, and manifest eternal values in a temporal arena. Um, and God is your, because God's your source of provision, not your job. But you, of course, you look to, you look to him for your source and, it's a, and your job is a means but never the true source. And then stewardship, we explored these additional components in addition to the usual time, talent, and treasure. We also added truth and people or relationships. It was hard for me, I couldn't come up with a fifth T that really works. I've got many people have made suggestions for a fifth T, but none, they were all forced. So unless, unless you can come with some. And now you're thinking about that. Spiritual life, and under that, we talked about the uh, cards themselves, which uh, we gave out and we have extras. The quiet time, so that that deals with per formal times with God, and then informal times are practicing his presence. That's the part that, in my view, has been largely overlooked by the church. In the history of the church, very few people have seriously considered what you do most of the day. Even if you have a Bible study or a, 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 a devotional with God in the morning, very few people then connect the rest of the day to him. You see, that's the problem. So in my view, it's an ongoing practice and process, you see. It's not just formal, but you want formal times because that's where you will then meet with him and study his word and so forth and, and listen to him, but also informal times when you're with people. 
when you're mixing it up with people in varying contexts. And everything matters in your life, you see. When you're driving, when you're talking with people, when you're uh, in, with your spouse, and all things matter. And so what does that look like? And we discussed that as well. And I had a book that's, that's called Life in the Presence of God. And indeed, uh, there's a separate, separate book from that that we created called A Guide to Practicing God's Presence because it's a kind of a manual for how you do that. And then we're created, we created an app called Presence, which we're about to update and improve so that a person can then have a thing that you can kind of control and it gets, gives you reminders as you choose to allow it to give you reminders. That would be a very useful uh, tool to begin to remind you to get into that uh, process. And that, I think, is a very overlooked thing that's been uh, needful. Um, we talked about 10 marks of a disciple and then a life of wisdom. That took us a while. And then purpose and passion. We've covered a lot of bases, haven't we, here? Um, and then discerning God's will and dealing with temptation. So now we're up to margin and life, effective communication and dealing with adversity. And then after that, Jesus will come. <laughs> it's time. I'm ready. I'm about ready with that. And with that in mind, by the way, I think about this whole idea of what that looks like um, as to a person who wants to order his, his, and you've seen this multiple times, but to order his chronos and to submit that to God's kairos. So really, if we're not careful, we're so much about our own planning and our control of our calendar, our agenda, our schedule, that we do not have enough op op openness to really what God's going to bring along the line and to invite your, us to actually modify our plans, Kronos, with God's opportunities, Kairos. And you can never plan opportunity. You can't plan Kairos. He's the one who brings that to you and in surprising forms. So if you're open to those mo moments and uh, prompts of the spirit and so forth, then you live, and I came, I came with a term for this, Kairos, what term might I live to turn it into a kind of an adjective? Kairotically. Not a bad term. I've never read that before, but it's a, it's a good term. We'll invent together, okay? Chirotically. What do I mean by living chirotically? You turn your plans and submit them to his. You see the idea? And that involves another word that I've given you before. When it tells us in Philippians 2 that Jesus emptied himself, he took on the form of a man, Kenosis is the word that's used when he divested himself of his divine privileges, you see, and humbled himself by taking on this form of a servant, not just a king. He didn't come as a king. He came as a servant. He didn't come to serve himself or to reign or rule, but rather he came to provide an opportunity for people to know him and that they would be delivered from their bondage to death and, and brought into his life. And so he came that they might live, that we might live. But then he will come as a king. We know that, and we're anticipating that. But in meanwhile, though, this idea of Jesus emptying himself, and it's just uh, to bring this to your mind here before we go op open it up a bit, but uh, the Philippians chapter 2, just so it's fresh in your thinking here, because he says, um, make my joy complete, being of the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. And then he says, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. That's not natural. It just doesn't ordinarily occur. It requires the Spirit of God in us. And then he tells his readers, do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others, which is then who is the ultimate exemplar? Obviously our Lord. And that is why he says then, have this mind, this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. He did not divest himself, by the way, of his deity. He divested himself of the voluntary use of his omni attributes, his, his, um, and, and he diminished that. Although there are times even there when he would know things or see things that would be used. But as a rule, he humbled himself and came in a position of a bondservant made in the likeness of men, 
being found in appearance of men as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient, obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. And so he became a true man. He became what he was not so that we could become what we were not. And so in doing so then, he became a bondservant for us. But that's the word that I want you to see, the word emptied himself in verse 7. And that's the word that um, I was just alluding to here, and one of, I think, Larry, you mentioned it here, and that would be kenosis. Kenosis means emptying. Now, here's, now turn that into an adverb, uh, adjective, rather. Living, how would you call that? It's got to be kenotic something, huh? Living kenotically. So I'm making it up, but I'm giving you a, a kind of a vocabulary of, of a way of imaging this. What I'm saying is you have to die to your own plans before you can actually live chirotically. You see, you have to allow God's opportunity to actually rule and reign. So when he gives you an invitation, and it might be, as you know, construed as an interruption, but actually it's pushes me back. I wanted to do this, but, you're, but this is happening. How do I receive that? Is God sovereign or not? So I have to adapt my plans, but it requires humility and emptying myself, of divesting myself, and he must increase, and what must I do? So in seeing that, it's the idea of John the Baptist, the baptizer, you see. He must increase, I must decrease. Now, the interesting thing is, the, the greater he is in your life, then the more you, full you become. So it's not a zero-sum game at all. But actually, Jesus says, you're not going to find true life, true joy, true peace, and all these other qualities we desire unless you go it God's way. It doesn't work your way. And you've, if you've tried that out, you've discovered that trying to do things in my way and forcing my plans and imposing my chronos plans upon everything else often blows up in our face. So there's times when I need to recognize and threat, actually throughout the course of the day, what did Jesus, Paul say? Paul says, I something daily. What did he say? I die daily. Jesus says, take up your cross. And this, so you must actually um, take up your cross daily, you see, so that you have a daily crucifixion, which means a death to something that's necessary. You've got to die to your agenda and be alive to him. He must increase. But the mo mo most amazing thing then, it's not a zero-sum game, but rather you will benefit a great deal more if you let God guide you than you because you don't really know what your best interests look like. How many times have I told you that? It's hard to convince men of that. It really is hard. I know it theoretically, but even now I get bummed out when things don't go my way. You see, when God brings up something that I didn't want to happen or allow something to happen, and I, why am I going through this, and this doesn't seem to be productive or useful or worthwhile, why is this happening? So I push back because what he's brought turns out to be a better good, but I can't see it until I let loose of my vision of what I thought my best interest looked like. I have to let loose of it. I have to die to that. That's kenosis. You have to empty yourself. And then kairos is to receive his agenda over your own. Does that make sense, that, that concept? What questions do you have on that? Because this is an important topic for me, and I've been chewing on this of late, especially as we go into this new year. What, anything that needs to be clarified on that? Because this is living can, uh, canonically and chirotically, as you now see, um, is critical. Yes? Empty yourself of, uh, you're emptying yourself of assuming of all your preconceptions, even your dreams. Yeah, even your dreams have to die. Yeah. And sometimes God allows the death of a vision because you are clinging to a vision of your own making that would have been ashes in your mouth if it had actually come to... You always can... It's just like temptation. Men only consider uh, the, the benefits, you know, so, so they, 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 they never think of the consequences, only the pleasures. 
That's why we can, we can uh, sin it in, in, in haste and repent at leisure. You see, then we'll have years of repentance for one presumptuous act. Same with anything. You think, and the problem will be, in an area where you think you have more knowledge, business, your work, your, your arena of, of, of expertise, that'll be the biggest temptation because you think, I've got this one. God can take care of other things, but he can't read a P&L. You see, he doesn't, can't, doesn't know how to run a business or whatever you want, might want it to be. Nonsense. So we have to back off. And so I find that I have to recognize that I think I know what's best. I, I certainly don't. And how many times have I had false starts? But then how many times have I pushed back against him? And remember the metaphor I've given you multiple times with C.S. Lewis with the dog on a leash. Remember it? The dog is on a long leash. And he eagerly moving forward, but then he turns to the right and goes around a, a lamp post or, or about a telephone pole, let's say. And then the dog wants to go that direction, continues to go, and he's just killing himself trying to go that direction because he's not succeeding. And then what must you do? What do you think the dog will think when you're making him go the exact opposite direction that he wants to take? in order to free you to be actually, to be, go, to be truly liberated. His service is your freedom. Only he is a, a, um, a, a, a good taskmaster because instead of his service, bondship to him is your freedom. Service to any other lord or master or agenda, it will not, you won't thrive. What, there was another question over here. Yes. I was going to say, I, I don't know that we as humans have the ability on a continuous basis to adopt. I think we have to trust in Him to help us do what is necessary. Yes. It's Him that accomplishes that. Right. So he's emphasizing the idea that even here in dying, it requires a divine human side because you can't do this of your own. You can't live the spiritual life. There are a lot of people who have experienced what I call frustrated inadequacy. They try so hard to do things for Jesus that they burn themselves out. I've seen this. But the thing is, instead of you trying to do it for him, remember the difference? Allow Jesus to do it through you. Huge difference. Huge difference. Otherwise, we count as service uh, what we do for him. And as Oswald Chambers said, he counts um, as discipleship, who we are to him, you see. So it's not service, but rather loving him and allowing him to rule and reign. So you can't do it on your own. So this, I say that the spiritual life isn't difficult. It is impossible. impossible. Only when you admit you can't do this does it then become possible because he is the one who can do it. But the, he'll not do it against your will. You see, without God, remember this phrase, without God, we cannot. Without us, we're, how it completed. Without God, we cannot. Without us, think of it. He will not. You can successfully resist the prompting of the Spirit of God. And you can therefore diminish your capacity so that after a while, you get accustomed to mediocrity. And that's a dangerous thing. And so it takes risk-taking to continue to grow. Without risk-taking, you're going to just succumb to a surface life, mediocrity. Was there a question? Did you have a question? Yeah. Yeah. One of the things I've been thinking about is uh, the monastic life. Or yes. The presence of God. Yes. And thinking of Brother Lawrence. Yes. Washing the dishes was, was uh, praise to God. It was part of his relationship. And as I think about that going through the day, trying to relate that everything I do is monastic in that I don't have to wait to, to take that trip to, to some sort of a, a spiritual center, but I can just survive in the day and work in the day that, that every time I bring my wife a cup of coffee, every time I empty the dishwasher, those things are being in the presence of God. Yes, the, the, all those things are equally spiritual because there's a phrase I've used before 
the secular, what we call secular, becomes spiritual when? When the focus of our heart is on the eternities. You see, when the focus of your heart is on God, then the so-called secular becomes spiritual when the focus of your heart is the eternal. Now, the interesting contrast is the so-called spiritual can become secular when the focus of your heart is the temporal. So people can do godly things or build businesses or, or churches or enterprises, and they can do it all in their own power and flesh. That's a dangerous thing, too. But I'm suggesting here that everything matters. Those two are the key words. Whenever I speak about what I call holistic spirituality, everything matters. There's no sacred secular dichotomy. And therefore, that means that everything that you can have splendor in the ordinary. Think of that. Splendor in the ordinary. And that means, to your point, you can wash the dishes. You can take out the garbage to the glory of God. There's nothing so minor, so small, that I cannot do that. And so it reminds me of, of George Herbert's, teach me my God and King in all things thee to see, and what I do in anything to do it as for thee. So everything connects, everything matters. And in that poem, he uses the illustration of a, basically a charwoman, a servant with this clause makes drudgery divine, who sweeps a room as for thy laws makes that in the action fine, which means that he's thinking about the worst occupation you could think of in, perhaps in Elizabethan England when he lived. A charwoman. What was a charwoman? C-H-A-R. Well, the first words suggest charcoal, you see, because how did they use charcoal in England in, the, in that period of time? To, for two large purposes, one for cooking and another for heating up the place. What did that mean? Somebody had to clean out the fireplace on a consistent basis. Often there would be a, a person who would then come through and on a regular basis clean out the soot and so forth and clean up the house. You see, it'd sweep the floors and all of that. Because you can imagine it gets nasty in that kind of environment. So he thinks, okay, what's the most unthankful job you might consider? Who would then, when a charwoman woman comes to your house, Think of honoring her, you see. You'd hardly even notice the servant who comes through and cleans. So he says, a servant with this clause, that is to say, to understand that what I do in anything, uh, I do it unto thee. So this tincture that he calls it is for thy sake. Everything can be done for thy sake. And then it takes the, elevates to extraordinary, not just ordinary. Small mundane tasks become significant because they're done for the glory of God. And so the ordinary becomes extraordinary. So he goes on to say, a servant with this clause, with that understanding, makes drudgery divine, who sweeps a room as for thy laws, makes that and the action fine. What do you mean by that? That and the action. I think he's saying that dignifies and elevates the work of being a charwoman to a high level, makes it fine. But secondly, the action is the way in which she executes her work. Even when there's nobody who appreciates it, no feedback, no nothing, she does it before the king. And therefore, what does that mean about the quality of her work? It will actually be better than if she's doing it to impress people. If you're doing it, to serve an invisible audience of one. That's a better thing. You actually, if anything, the standard of your work will be of the highest integrity, you see? Um, and you won't cheat. You won't change the materials or whatever. If, 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 whatever. There's lots of cutting of corners that we might be tempted to do. You couldn't do that when you're trying to please God because he, you can't embezzle God, you can't deceive him, you see, you can't outfox him. And therefore, if you're doing it to an invisible audience of one, what will happen to the standard of your work? It'll be better than if you're doing it to please and impress people. So a servant with this clause, with that understanding, makes drudgery divine. Who sweeps a room as for thy laws makes that in the action fine. And that means who serves his wife by doing 
the dishes makes that and the action finer, whatever it might happen to be. You see my point here? Everything matters. And then it's also, when I connect that with Kronos and Kairos, there are going to be things you didn't plan that will also matter, that you didn't think mattered, but when he brings it to you, you have to empty yourself and receive. All these things, as you can see, they all connect together in a very, in my view, a very clear light, uh, sense. There were three forms of living, um, and you just mentioned the monastics. And so there was what they called the religious life, and I'm trying to f find that. I had a little name for that, um, and I cannot rem remember. I, sometimes if I don't name it correctly, I can't figure out where I put a thing, so I might not be able to find it. I'm gonna, I won't worry about that. I've been told, don't frustrate people so much by looking for things, so I'm gonna stop doing that. Um, but that said, though, um, think of it this way. You had the religious, and that was the priests and the monks. They were called the religious. That's, like, that's the term that was used, the religious. And then the rest of us, the laity, and they were called the active life, you see? So the basic ideas is you'd either be having a contemplative life or you'd have a life of action in this world. Now, you can guess that they made the religious more substantive than the, the active. You, he, you can see where I'm coming. I'm coming from a third option. And I think it's the option that Jesus adopted. It's called the mixed life. The mixed life is when you are a contemplative, but in your contemplative in action. Now you bring your intimacy with Jesus and your solitude and silence with you into the public arena. And there's a quality about you that transcends your circumstances. There's something about you that has this with the odor of the eternal, of the transcendent about you, that you're a fragrance uh, of Christ where you are because you are now pursuing that higher good. You're allowing him to guide you and control you. So I love this idea. Jesus was a contemplative in action so that he had his intimacy with the Father, but that animated and energized his active work. I think that's what I'd want for us. But that you'd not just be an active only, because then you'd have, you would not have enough in your inner growth to, sub, to sustain um, outward um, things. So you don't want your, your, your um, inner growth not to be able to activate the outward activity. My problem, and it's a problem we're gonna be addressing when we're talking starting next week with margin, is that often, I don't have enough inner cultivation to sustain outward activity. You see, and then it sounds good, but it's really something that I'm trying to attempt more in outward activity than I can sustain in inward growth and in inward intimacy. I claim that intimacy energizes and animates activity. But intimacy requires a risk of spending time with them. And so they all go together. Um, so that's, I'm glad you brought that up. So I, I'd like you to become, like Jesus, a contemplative in action. He brought his solitude. He brought his intimacy with the Father. He did everything. He said, I never do anything unless the Spirit guides me. That wouldn't be a bad way to live. Allow the Spirit. And so it's Spirit-led as well. And so what a way you train yourself that, and these are just lessons we've been talking about, is by listening more quietly or more promptly or in a, to the promptings of the Spirit. If you begin to train yourself to be eager to hear that small, quiet voice, then you'll hear the kairos, because that'll be the Spirit inviting you to do something. But if you are tuning it out, if you're so filled with your own agenda, and your own ideas, and you're not listening and inviting the Spirit to guide you, you can steamroll that quiet prompt of the Spirit of God. And after a while, diminish your capacity to hear it. I think that your capacity to hear His voice increases when you obey His voice. So obedience becomes the key to intimacy. So if you want to know Him better, obey what I called you to do. 
you see. So do what I tell you. If you love me, you'll do what I call you to do. And that's all these things. You see, again, all these are threads, aren't they, that connect together. It's a way of viewing, viewing life from an eternal perspective, a pilgrim mindset, rather than, rather than the idea of this being home. I find it very difficult to convince people to long for heaven. Very hard these days. I think the older we get, the more we should be thinking of home. Instead, we think of retirement or trying to stretch out our time on this dark world, you see, in this present darkness. People would rather have more time in this earth, even with its increasing troubles, than they would in their real heart of hearts to be with Jesus in the heavenlies. I don't know why that is, because this is, they, can't, they haven't cultivated in a desire for home. And I was talking with Larry about that today. I was going to say, remind me if I don't bring this up, but now you don't have to remind me. <laughs> because I've been talking with my bride more about heaven than ever. I want her to think together with me how we will be. Because after all, you're not defined by this body, by this earth suit. If you were, we're all in serious trouble, you see, because we're wearing out. And that's the, our, the, the fragility of our, of our mortality is upon us. And the, 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 basically, uh, the problem of degradation. It's a depressing thing to look in the mirror, um, especially if you see old pictures and so forth. And you know you don't look like you used to look, although we sometimes suppose we do. Let's be honest about it. When you see a person after five, ten years of, of being away, and they say you look great, you haven't changed a bit, you know they're lying. <laughs> you look terrible, and so do I. Let's be honest about it. Some, uh, some of us may cheat the clock a little bit better than others, but we're all, some of us decay more nicely, perhaps, but we're all in decay, you see. The, 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 and I'm not being depressing, I'm being realistic. You were never meant to be on this planet for more than a few decades. What were you, what's this planet for? Preparation. Preparation for home. He's, you see, he's preparing your soul. That's why I call this a soul-forming world. Because he's shaping you. In your deepest self, in your spirit, you're already with him in heaven. You're already with him. What does he say we are? According to scripture, seated with him where? At the right hand of the Father? I'd say that you can't do better. That's where you are. Although very, very few believers see themselves as God sees them. Very few. Those few who do, though, still haven't got this, in many cases, that longing for home. You should become increasingly world weary and homesick. That's what you should be doing. And that is not depressing. It's like this, this uh, minister in England who was asked, uh, Vicar, what, what do you think will happen when you die? And he said, well, I suppose I shall go to eternal bliss in heaven, but I really wish you wouldn't uh, bring up such depressing topics. What's going on there? He says he believes in it, but he doesn't want to be there. At my, at my sister's celebration of her life, that's what happened last week, uh, last year. And when we celebrated um, her life, she, uh, she went to be with Jesus in February, but we didn't celebrate her life until her birthday in August. And it was very obvious they would much rather her be with them in this present darkness than to be with Jesus. It was obvious. Because they, don't have a, they haven't cultivated an appetite for, for the things that matter and last. And if you don't have that appetite, that eternal perspective, you're greatly diminished. So how do I convince a person that you're gonna only be here a few years? If you can't, if it's not obvious physically, there's something, you're missing something. It should be painfully obvious. Remember, age, what does it do? Conspires with God to transfer our hope from the temporal to the eternal. It's a conspiracy, I tell you, because if you reached Let's say your optimal strength, say you're 21 and then you stop uh, aging and then you, and you never diminish your energy. So you're just as healthy and strong 
when you're 100 years old, 121, as you were when you turned 21. Think of that for a moment. Wouldn't that be an interesting world? Think there's some downsides to that world. We'd be so tethered to this world that we couldn't have our appetite for our true home, you see. So God allows us to have the, the effect of the fall, which is palpable and evident visibly. So our physical diminishment that, that is also a realization that we're not home. Why then we're we here? To get us ready for home and to bring us more like, make us more like Jesus in our thoughts, words, and deeds, and to give us a heart of wisdom and to become more like him in that way so that you're ready, increasingly ready for home. But again, very few believers do this. They don't have an appetite for home. I don't see why you wouldn't. Let's think about it for a moment. Think about, yeah, go ahead. A little panic Yeah. A few years ago, in my Sunday school class, there was a lady who visited a friend of hers who had terminal cancer, and she always had a few weeks to live. And uh, during the visit, uh, my friend Jackie was talking with this lady, and the lady said, well, I've only got a few more weeks to be here. Huh. And that's the that's yeah. Why do we, we why do so few few people look at it that way? And, but that's how you should be. You see, this is a good thing. Um, I was talking with a friend yesterday, and uh, he thought he had a heart condition. And there was some real pain and so forth. I mean, he discovered when he went to the cardiologist and had a test that he actually has almost very, very little calcium, no blockage at all. He's perfectly well. There's other things instead, stress that was affecting him. And he's kind of disappointed. <laughs> because he really was beginning to long for home. Well, that's a rather good thing. Most of us would think that's, 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 not, that's great news. No, actually, in a way, now he has to hang around here longer, you see. To depart and be with Jesus is far better. But, I must, but for your sakes, I must stay longer, Paul tells the Philippians. Remember that? For me to be with Christ, to, to, for me to die, to live is to, to die is to actually, is, is Christ. And so that's gain. We don't live that way. But think about this. Painless, sinless, deathless, um, um, no, sick, no sickness, no need for anything. Think of that world. A painless, deathless, uh, sinless world where the world system is now gone, no longer able to wield its influence on us. How the world wants to pull us away from Jesus. And how people allow themselves to do it by listening more to the world than to the word. But then the world will be gone, this, its system. The flesh, what Paul calls the power of sin in my members, that'll be gone. At the judgment seat, that'll be dealt with. Only he can do it. He, only he can do it. Because you can't clean up your flesh and remove it. That'll happen when he does it. Um, then the flesh will be gone. And then third, what's the third? World flesh and the what? What will happen there? The devil and his angels will have been judged and, and, and been confined. What does that mean now? Now there's no death, no, no sickness, no pain, no loss. And moreover, we live in a, in a world that, that now is not pulled, pulling me away, but my milieu actually is the, the, theistic. It is, in fact, all doxological. It's all about the glory of God. I'm in a different world. And the devil and the angels and the, this flesh, suddenly I can't even think sin anymore. It's a rather nice thought, isn't it? Now imagine, it, 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 add, to, add to that thought. You've got that picture so far? What that'll be like? Because now you will be with people and there'll be no diminishment. And, and that, that possibility is astonishing to me. Um, but then now add to that, you're in a glorified, resurrected body. That... Um, is incredible. Your, your, your mental capacity will be far, vastly greater. Your sensory capacity, and because you're going to be, in addition to that, in a new creation that's not marred by sin. 
the effects of the curse will be removed. And therefore, you will be a resurrected, glorified being who can then see God and they shall see him. No one can look on God and live in this life. But it says, Revelation 22, they will see God in your resurrected existence. You see what the implications of that are? And then you will be in a new order of physics that where, where space and time and your experience of that will actually be to the glory of God. Your experience of it will be vastly richer than it is now. You put all that stuff together, what are you getting? And then you get this capacity, mental capacity, you'll be able to see and hear and do things you could never imagine. And your relationships will be unbounded. And then here, you get to garden in the perfect garden where nothing is recalcitrant. Remember, with the fall, all of a sudden, thorns and thistles. And before, it was a joy. Now it's a burden. Now the joy will return. And even in gardening, physical, whether a physical sort or in a creative sort, will be beyond belief because it will cooperate with you rather than resist you. Right now, you have to earn your food by the sweat of your brow, and that, and that it was not necessary then. And so all those things are removed. And one last thing that comes to my mind, I've been thinking about this. I'm going to give you a funny word for this one. Yeah, are you ready for this word? Some of you will never have heard it before. Propinquity. How many of you know what that word means, propinquity? It's an interesting word. I want you to look it up. It means nearness or closeness. It is by dint of spatiotemporal propinquity, isn't that a great way, um, to, to say we're connected with our loved ones, but it only goes about two generations before you and about two generations after that, and then as, at, at, much before that, it's so theoretical that it has no connection with you. I th I've been thinking about this. In other words, I can go, I have I cared about my grandparents as well as my parents. My great grandparents, no relationship, it's an abstract thought. My great great grandchildren, abstract. I have no connection with them. Do you see my, my, my very, very narrow bandwidth? I think in part because we couldn't endure more than that. The loss of a loved one or a child, you see all the pain that's involved in that, because by dint of propinquity, you couldn't endure much more than that little tiny, tiny range of all of human life. You see where I'm going with that? One day you will, because the body of Christ then, you will have propinquity with all believers in Jesus, and you will have an intimacy with them that transcends this earthbound barrier. So I've been thinking about, these are all ideas I've been chewing on and thinking about of late. Um, so I do thought experiments with Karen about what we'll be doing together because we're a dyad. And in Jesus, we're really a triad. You see, one plus one equals one. That's the mathematics. And so it is with the Trinity then, the three and one, and one and three. So it's triadic. So we are in, in each other and, and, and Jesus is in us. So it's very, it'll go on, I think, in, into the eternities. So I've asked her what places, what things she wants to do. It won't be places on this earth, it'll be a richer earth, but what things you would enjoy doing? What do you long to do? As there's so much things that I have more ideas now than I ever had before. And as a reminder then, you're never gonna be able to do these things because not every idea has to be a future book. I, I actually have uh, three pages of pro products and pro uh, projects I want to do, about 70 of these projects. I'm not going to do that, nor should I make, make my identity based upon production, but rather faithfulness opportunity. But that's an invitation to see there'll be plenty of time. The things you can't do now, there's a lot of things you will not have time that you could do. I bet some of you would love to learn an instrument or any number of things. I would love to be able to have the freedom to play a Chopin pol polonaise with freedom as I see people. But wouldn't that be lovely to just suddenly have the ability to do that and make that music sound? But well, you can't do it unless you pay the price of discipline. And so, ah, in God's created order, You'll be able to do stuff you'll never have time in this earth to do. Time will be your agent, not your enemy. It'll serve you. 
and everything will cooperate. And even the animals, that, that realm of nature, will be actually redeemed in such a way that you will have um, a, a, everything moving together in a way we can hardly begin to imagine. Now, those kinds of thoughts are high and worthy of attention because that's thoughts of reality. I'm not talking about pie in the sky. I'm talking about the, what the living God who came back from the dead has told us and what he's preparing for us. In Revelation 20 to 22, especially uh, 21 and 22, tell us about home. So I'm saying that's not, that's not escapism or fantasy. It's reality, it's home, but very few people want it. Not many people have an appetite for it. They're more interested in stretching out their few years in this world than to embrace a growing appetite for what he's planning for him in the next, because he will be the one who rules and reigns. And so it'll all be done with perfect freedom uh, to the glory of God. It's gonna be an amazing thing. We just need to cultivate the appetite. What, what thoughts do you have on that? That's my little, that's, those are some things I've been chewing on, yes. Just a comment. You know, we're here on this earth for a reason. God really is prepared for the future, but for another purpose. Mm hmm. And Luke, uh, I know, believe also that if you believe to see Christ in the book of Acts, the reason we're here, I believe, I believe is the reason I got saved is so I could tell my friends and family who you don't know, and I don't know your friends and family, that they need to see Christ in us for that reason, to live for them to see Christ, to have the, as you said, that. Yes. And that hope needs to be set abroad. Most of us don't speak up. They don't yes. Our best friends are our best. And, and I think you're absolutely right about that. And I'm so glad you brought that up because um, you're dealing with the, uh, great, um, the great commission here. Because the great commission is to make disciples. But notice it has the going. You have to go, into, you have to go and, uh, and into their world to bring them into yours. And that's then baptizing. And... The word baptizing doesn't mean that they're regenerated by baptism. It's a sign of their, re of their, re of their redemption. In, words, in, in the book of Acts, in every instance, when a person comes to faith in Jesus, they get baptized right afterwards, every time. They don't wait long because it's a public display of this new quality. That's the point of evangelism. So I'm a very big believer in what I have called E squared. What do I mean by E squared? Edification, more evangelism and edification. That's our, our mission on this earth. So I'm so glad you brought that up. You are here to become like him and to reproduce that life in the lives of others. And, but the, at the end, though, it's all about making disciples because at the end, all these words, and this is really... It's a participle, so it could be translated going, baptizing, teaching. All three of these participles modify the main command. There's only one mandate, one verse, uh, one word, one commandment, and it's to make disciples. And so that's, uh, so this is basically uh, evangelism, and this is edification. So it's the E squared, you see. Evangelism one, edification two, or what do you want to call it, E squared, I don't care. The point is that it's... Uh, that's your mission. That's, by the way, why I created this. Several of us, three of us created this thing because this is exactly what this is about. Is, and I want, a lot of people are afraid to share their faith. At least anybody can do this. I can take this little card. And I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna print up these cards and give some of them to you. I can take this card, stick it in this book, and as the spirit prompts me, I just have to remember always to bring them with me. And we're gonna have a paperback soon too. But um, I can give it to someone. I just gave it to someone uh, the other day who was, didn't expect to get it. <laughs> and uh, I didn't expect to give it. So let the spirit guide you. Sometimes, if I'm led, I might leave it in the hotel lobby. They see this card in there. The card and it says, I invite you to use this simple book to expose yourself to some of the most important words by the most important uh, person in all of history. And so, it, it's assuming no bi prior Bible knowledge and avoiding the usual Christian jargon, Jesus, in his own words, hits the highlights of the messages Jesus spoke during his time on earth. Whether you're a follower of Jesus or not, I hope 
This book spurs you to further exploration and study, to open consideration of the words here, and then to a deeper understanding of the one who lived and spoke as no other. And then I have a little quote, the words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. And so I stick it there. So if somebody saw that, well, what's this thing? It's a very nice looking thing. It's bonded leather and it's a very, very uh, uh, nice il illustrations and so forth uh, with, with the uh, red uh, ink as well as the, the uh, black ink. So it's a, it's a very pretty book in many ways. And so it has these, uh, these illustrations. So if somebody says that, they're not going to throw it away. It's too nice. That's the whole point. But if they, saw, if they picked it up, they'd see the card. It says, okay, take this book. So I'm just saying, to your point, that anybody can do. I'm, I'm going to uh, talk with churches and pastors to consider a, a program of, for, their, for their members. Get one, give four. See the idea? You take one, but you're really give, getting them to give. And as the Spirit guides you, you give it. Because to me, it's better than a tract, and it's better than a New Testament. So that's, that's the whole point. Why? It allows people to hear Jesus in his own words. To hear him firsthand. Not, most people's knowledge of Jesus is second and third hand at best. It's not, I'm not trying to do an ad. I'm just saying my heart is there. All of a sudden, I can do that. And you're empowering people who might not have been able to do it to be able to do it as the Spirit prompts. Do you see, does that make sense to you? So, but then the other thing is discipleship, and I'm very big on that. And that's why I've created things like Conform to His Image, to help people become more like Jesus. So that's a lot of yapping, I know. Um, and we've covered a lot of territory, a lot of uh, areas. Any other thoughts? Because since we're going all over the map anyway, yes, uh, Art? You've mentioned several times Men have very few close relationships. Yeah. Very yeah, most men. people, the, the friendless American male came out a number of years ago. Yeah. So, it was, it, but. In terms of a soldier out there, is there any hope of change in the male attitude? <laughs> oh, you don't have to worry about hope of change. Um, right there, all those things will be removed. And then, remember I talked about closeness, intimacy? Um, that'll be so rich and profound. Friends um, are in love with the same idea, and so we will share all, all that in common. I think there'll be a, a great intimacy, great connection. As Larry just told me, you're stuck with me forever. Well, think about that. Think of what that means. What does that mean? It means you'll be able to do whatever you choose together to do. And any group can become a, a many churches that were an ecclesial thing. And they can do things, the total being the greater than the sum of the parts. Imagine us having a meeting. The exact people, the, the very same men, um, plan a meeting, let's say 500 years in the future. All right? And I don't know where exactly what that'll be like, but if you envision everyone in this room, you're going to remember, by the way, when that will be. So why, why don't we set a date? You see? Um, and the idea is that all the possibilities that you would long for and <coughs> wish for are really yours. And the, Bob Mar Mar Margolin and I were talking about a topic, a talk, um, and I've, I was talking about um, identity, purpose, and hope. Who are you? Why are you here? And where are you going? There, you will have that which you hope for. Because when you have it, you don't have to hope for it anymore. It's yours. So I think if we become more homesick and begin to train ourselves, think about doing exercises that way. Because you've got to prepare yourself. You're not going to be in this earth suit for much longer. But you will be in that glorified, resurrected body forever. And there will be no diminishment, no pain, no loss, no tears. Any other uh, last? Uh, yes. Yeah, I've got something I was going to read. Yeah, this is, there's, with everything's wrong in this world, everybody's fighting each other and harassing each other. I saw this in the said This was uh, John Newton, who wrote Amazing Grace, counseling a, a minister who's having a battle with another minister mm -hmm. over some doctrinal issues. And this is what he said. He said, the words of David to Joab concerning Absalom are very applicable. Deal gently with him for my sake. The Lord loves him and bears with him. Therefore, you must not despise him 
or treat him harshly. The Lord bears with you likewise and expects that you should show tenderness to others from a sense of the much forgiveness you need yourself. This is what he said. In a little while, you will meet in heaven with him. He will then be much dearer to you than the nearest stranger has upon earth is to you now. Anticipate that period in your thoughts. You him personally as a tender soul with whom you will be happy in Christ forever. That's a good word. So he's saying, um, you didn't all hear it, but um, essentially, and you might want to send that quote to Dennis. Would you do that? And then Dennis can convey it to the rest of us because I like that last part. This person, this acquaintance, will be nearer to you right then than your dearest friend. Propinquity will be universal in the body of Christ.